Hey, good morning, friends. It's Sunday morning. It's our time together. Welcome to uh, my podcast on Sunday morning. Welcome to my shut-ins. It is a uh, privilege, privilege to be here. A uh, couple of quick announcements. Um, don't forget about our live services every Thursday and Friday nights at 7 o'clock. They're broadcast live on our YouTube teaching channel. You just go to youtube.com slash House of Healing AZ. And we also uh, broadcast on a few other platforms. And uh, I usually teach on Friday nights, the deep things of God. And it's uh, broadcast at 7 p.m. Arizona time and Pacific time. And I hope you'll join us. They are tremendous services. Rick is a, Rick is a remarkable teacher. Um, he's very blunt, and uh, you know, he, you know, his personality, uh, you know, isn't uh, isn't uh, you know, doesn't have a broad section of appeal. But uh, if you're looking for truth and you're looking for some real insight into the spirit world, Thursday nights with Rick is fantastic. Please remember our three Zoom services every week. Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Monday nights is our ladies' Zoom, 6.30 p.m. Arizona Pacific time. Then Wednesday and Saturday nights is at 6 o'clock Arizona and Pacific time. You can contact me at mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you all the information about all of our ministry services, or you can go to the website, and you can check some of the stuff out there. So um, our main goal is to see you healed and delivered. And uh, nothing else uh, is really on the table. I don't do any fundraising of any significant nature at all. I simply mention that you can donate if you want to. Uh, I never have done uh, fundraising for the ministry. Never did it. And uh, God has always sent the money in. The donations come in on a regular basis. And I don't ask people for money. I don't believe in that kind of thing. I'm not a TV preacher type person. But the Lord is faithful. He comes through. And uh, to me, um, life isn't about money. I used to be loaded with demons, and I worshiped the almighty buck for years. I used to be a multi-millionaire. And uh, 2009 wiped me out. But When I came to the Lord, I realized, hey, I got to get rid of this concept of money. And so uh, I repented of it. Huge. I don't even take a salary in the ministry. I've been doing this for years. I'm a volunteer like everybody else at the Deliverance Center. We're all volunteers. We all want to help you. And that's the bottom line, period. We We just want to help you. And that's the kind of people I like to put on my ministry team, people who care about people. That's the most important thing. You know, the rest of it is all secondary. Everything else is secondary. You know, you gotta, you've got to have a some kind of love and concern for people, particularly to be in the deliverance ministry, because you got to have the patience of Job to do this kind of work. I mean, huge. Because uh, as Rodney Dangerfield used to say, people are nuts. Uh, When you were talking about Christians heavily infected with demons, I mean, it's you got to have just nothing but um, care and patience for these people. And so I've developed that over the years. I've been a counselor for over 40 years. So people have always been my business. That's all I've ever done. That's all I ever was interested in doing. When I went to college, uh, when I was young, I already knew what I wanted to do. And it all just kind of fell in place for me. Got another good one for you today. Let's go to a uh, shocking section of text in the Old Testament. Now, remember, remember this now. The Old Testament law has been abolished. But the New, New Covenant, the New Testament laws, included some of the Old Testament laws. So, The laws that did not transfer from the Old Testament covenant to the New Testament covenant, 
have been abolished, as Paul explained. Go to the website, hardcorechristianity.com. Hit the teaching button at the top and go down to is the law of Moses for today. Explains it all right there. All the scriptures are there. The law of Moses, including the Sabbath, all that stuff. The law of Moses is abolished. But it was replaced by the New Testament. Now, now remember, there were over 600 laws in the Old Testament covenant. There's over a thousand in the New Testament covenant. Did you know that? Yeah. Wow. The New Covenant covenant is far more expansive than the Old Testament covenant. The Old Testament covenant, as Paul said, uh, no flesh shall ever be justified through the law. And when he made that statement, the Jews turned on him for the rest of his life. They hated his guts from that day forward. By the works of the law, no flesh will ever be justified. And that was, boom, the end of the road for Paul. The, the uh, nation of Israel, the Jews, the Pharisees, the scribes, Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, everything. They all turned on him because nobody would ever dare make a statement like that. Brother Paul, Brother Paul's my favorite guy, man. He's something else. He's got guts. Boy, he's got guts. He had guts like you can't even believe, way beyond what Peter had and the other disciples. I mean, he was a freak. He would say the truth, and he didn't care who was listening. I mean, literally didn't care. If it was the emperor, he wouldn't have cared. By the works of the law, no flesh will ever be justified. And that was the bomb that got him rejected from the nation of Israel and the Jews. I mean, that was a nuke of staggering proportions. I mean, it was, uh, it was worse than a bunch of beepers sent in, sent to Lebanon by Israel. That's how bad it was. I mean, boom, 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 boom. It was, wow, W-O-W. But let's go back together, shall we? To Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Okay, this is the Law of Moses. Chapter 28. Now, these laws, this concept was carried over from the Old Testament contract to the New Testament contract. And Paul summed it up in Galatians chapter 6. He said, whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. What was he doing there? Paul, went, Paul was a doctor of the law. Uh, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Pharisees came to him for the interpretation of the law. I mean, he was so far up in Jewish society. It was amazing. The guy was unbelievable. He gave up everything. Wife, kids, career, money. I mean, it was all gone. He sacrificed everything he had to serve the Lord. Guy was flat out remarkable. So he explains what is true for sinners and what is true for saints. Everybody. Everybody falls under the New Testament law. And here it is. Here it is. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Now go back to Deuteronomy 28 uh, with me, if you would. Let's go back uh, almost 3,000 years. Verse 1. It shall come to pass, says the Lord, if you will hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord, the Lord your God, and you observe and do. Now notice that that transfers directly to the New Testament covenant. Jesus said, you are my friends. If you do what I told you, you wouldn't believe how many times in the I've gotten in trouble over the years. Just got my face kicked in when I was observing God's law but I wasn't doing it. I mean, I got myself in trouble so many times, it's unbelievable. 
but I had violated the New Testament covenant. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. That is a, a law of God that is as sure as gravity. That's a net, gravity is a natural law of God. This is a spiritual law. If you observe and do his commandments, which I command you this day, says the Lord, I will set you high above all nations and all the blessings shall come upon you and they will overtake you if you shall hearken to the voice of the Lord your God. Translations, Galatians, right? Galatians. Chapter 6. How am I doing so far? I always try to keep my teachings extremely, you know, simple. Right? That's what I always do. And then, later on in this chapter, he says, he says, if you do not do. Verse 15. It shall come to pass that if you will not listen to the voice of the Lord your God and you do not observe and do his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, all the curses shall come upon you and they will overtake you and you will be cursed in the city and you will be cursed in the field. Your basket shall be cursed. Your store shall be cursed. The fruit of your body, translation, your children shall be cursed. Now go back in your life for a quick second if you would. And take a look and a listen why your kids are so jacked up. Does anybody know? I just read it to you. I just read it to you. That is why your kids are jacked up. You, when you were young, did not observe and do commandments of the Lord and the devil said oh okay the devil's got the whole Bible memorized by the way he can quote it chapter and verse and by the way he can quote it in any version of the Bible huh he can quote the New World Translation from the Jehovah Witnesses chapter and verse all the way through it because he helped create that Bible he ought to know how to quote it he can quote the Book of Mormon chapter and verse, including all the all the verses in the King James Bible that Joseph Smith copied and put in the Book of Mormon. Have you ever seen the Book of Mormon? It reads like a thing reads like a comic book. It's hilarious. He can quote all that stuff in any version you like, in any language you like. Doesn't matter. Do they have a uh, New Testament or a Book of Mormon? Translated in Mongolian? I don't know. But if they do, he can quote it chapter and verse. And the devil goes, hey, you're not raising your children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Hey, I, I'm, I'm not criticizing you. I was there. I, would, I was living in sin for decades. I get it. Hey, your, your kids get cursed. You get Things start going bad. You know, your business starts to suck. Why? Because you're cursed in the city and you're cursed in the field. Translation, that's your, your business, your job, your career. Your basket's curse. What is that? The necessities for your family is a struggle. Your store is cursed. You're self-employed. You have your own business. Oh, man. Up and down, isn't it? You will be cursed when you come in. 
you will be cursed when you go out. Dang. Dude. But if you do and observe the word of the Lord, guess what happens? You are set high above all nations on the earth. That's literally true. If you're a born-again, spirit-filled Christian and you're following, you're walking in the spirit, not in the flesh, you really are, on a spiritual basis, set above all nations on the earth. You're up here, man. You're up here. This law of sowing and reaping, to be honest with you, it's glorious, it's wonderful, and it's horrible. It's an enormous dichotomy. All right? If you use that law to be a blessing for you, you will have an anointing and a call from God on your life, and you will fulfill a destiny people are mind boggled over. If you use it for sin, wow, you live a carnal Christian life and your blessings go and then they fail. They go, then they fail. And you get this yo-yo Christian effect throughout your Christian life. And you never, you never fulfill your destiny and you don't receive the call of God on your life. It passes you by like a ship in the night. You know something, a, a cruise ship, man, those things are big. All the cruise ships are bigger than the Titanic. You know, those things can go right by your shore and you won't wake up at night to hear them. The cruise ships come in and out of the harbors at night. People don't even wake up. You can't violate the laws of God. And as a born again, spirit filled Christian, we're not supposed to want to deny, violate the laws of God. We're supposed to want to observe and do all those things that Jesus said. Listen, if you're my friend, <coughs> excuse me, if you're my friends, you will do what I command you. Friendship is based on obedience. I know that's a horrible thought, but lip service doesn't go anywhere. Wigglesworth learned when he was 40 years old. Okay, he had been in the ministry for years supporting his wife's ministry. She was a spectacular preacher, very anointed. And Wigglesworth would support her ministry, okay? Because he had struggled with years with stuttering and he had low self-esteem and he didn't feel comfortable speaking in groups. He'd get up there and he couldn't talk and he was all tongue-tied. Well, he had got filled with the Holy Ghost when he was 40 years old. Uh, in another city, he traveled there because the Holy Spirit was being poured out and people were getting the gift of tongues. Well, this fascinated Wigglesworth and he thought, man, I want more of God, and I need to get rid of my carnal life here. He had a temper, too. Wigglesworth had a temper, speech impediment and a temper. Boy, those two things are tough because when you got a temper, it's difficult for you to curse somebody out because you can't get the words out. It's frustrating. He goes to this Holy Ghost revival, and at the end of the revival, he gets filled with the Spirit while he's praying by himself. And that's not unusual. I've seen... I don't know how many people have been in my office over the years, maybe a hundred or so, who have who told me that story. They got filled with the Spirit. And they started speaking in tongues when they were at home, alone. So it happens. I know it happens. And um, from that moment on, Wigglesworth, Wigglesworth completely changed. And he became, what they called him, was the Apostle of Faith. And he used to teach about the Law of Faith that Paul mentions. And once again, Jesus said, if you do these things, 
you observe them and do them, you will have these miracles. If you observe and do them, you will see all these healings. You will see these deliverances. And so Wigglesworth went around much of the world. It's unbelievable. Teaching people. Teaching them. That these are the steps of obedience to God to trigger the powerful moving of the spirit. And that's why there's so little real moving of the spirit in our churches is because people don't observe and do the principles of the law of faith that Wigglesworth taught. This isn't rocket science, but I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a challenge you can't believe because, well, actually you do believe it, because the devil is is facing you as an adversary every step of the way. So, you know, I mean, Dairy Creens were on a special right now on Sundays, okay? And, and my wife has got a sweet tooth, so she likes to go down to Dairy Queen and get one of these Sundays. They're on sale for $3.50. I think they're normally five-something. So... I say, yeah, I'll go with you. So we hop in the car and head on down to Dairy Queen so you can get a Sunday. Well, you know, if you sit at home and go, you know, I wish I had a Sunday. I got to just sit here and meditate and maybe one will pop in my lap. No, you got to observe she saw the sign when we drove by Sunday it's on sale. And she <laughs> said, hey, I'm going to observe and do the desires of my sweet tooth. So we drive down there and we get a Sunday. So, you know, Wigglesworth was the exact same way. He taught the law of faith. He taught that having faith isn't enough, that you must step out on that faith. And that triggers the moving of the Holy Ghost. And that's what he taught all over the place. Spectacular ministry, to say the least. But he learned that principle of the law of faith. And he mesmerized people because the veil had been removed and everybody began to see, hey, wait a minute, the, the word of God is not complicated. This thing's being veiled by Satan. He's blinding the minds of those people who are in the process of being destroyed. He blinds their minds, the thoughts in their mind. He blocks them. And Wiggles was just simply unveiled it and, and kept it simple. So I've done the same thing in my ministry over the last couple of decades. Because I saw him do it. So I thought, well, he would certainly know far more about it than I would. I think I'll follow this Wigglesworth pattern. So I, I got all Wigglesworth. I've got all of Wigglesworth's books. I've got a stack of them in my library here at the house. I read all them books. And I saw a pattern in his behavior. He said, hey, faith is no good unless you step out on it. Jesus' half-brother James, he said, hey, listen, faith without works is dead. And so this simple concept, well, the law of sowing and reaping is also in the same category as the law of faith that Wigglesworth taught. It's extremely simple. Whatever you sow, that's what you will reap. And Wigglesworth chose to sow faith based behaviors and as a result of that he saw miracles that nobody even can even believe to this day there there are there's no one in the united states like smith wigglesworth not one one human being not one person because he had grasped this concept the simplicity of christ as paul spoke in galatians And the things that have not materialized in your life and your 
sucked marriage and your stinking business and your crazy kids. All that stuff is the result. As Wigglesworth said, hey, you're, you're not observing Deuteronomy 28 and doing the word of God. And therefore, everything you sow is what you reap. It can be incredibly good things or it can be incredibly bad things. And here's what's crazy about it. Deuteronomy 28 was based upon who? The Jews. The Jews. It wasn't based on God. It wasn't based on the devil. See? It was based on them. Choose this day whom you will serve, Joshua said. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's always based on human free will. Calvinism is a lie. It's all false doctrines. Anybody involved with Calvinism, find you a trash can and throw it in. Human free will determines the move of God in your life. I'm constantly teaching Ephesians chapter 1 that God is not mad at you anymore. He's not criticizing you anymore. He unconditionally loves you and he wants to help you. That's, that's just completely 100% scriptural. I can prove that from today until all the cows come home. But, but, there's a but here. In the Bible, it's, an, it's the word if. There's a but here. In the word of God, it's, it's the word if. Okay, and That's what he said. It should come to pass, Deuteronomy 28, 15. If you will not listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and if you will not observe and do, and do all his commandments and his statutes. All the curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Just like he said, all the blessings would overcome you and overtake you. He now says the curses will. What's it all based on? The hub of the wheel is connects all the spokes. You can take a spoke out of the wheel and still ride the bike. The hub of the wheel removed, the bike collapses. The hub of the wheel is you. You are the hub of the wheel. You're it. At, to this, this day, right here, today, you could turn your life around completely today. And you could blow the devil out the doors. You could kick his face in today. But you would have to decide what life you're going to have. What kind of a person are you going to be? And all of that is based on your free will. Now, in my counseling practice, obviously, there's a point where free will is lost, and that's with the SMIs, the seriously mentally ill. Yeah, over a period of years, their minds are taken, and they've lost their free will, okay? Many years ago, I had a Department of Corrections card, and I used to travel around to all the prisons in the state of Arizona. I had a huge prison deliverance ministry. I spent a lot of time on the road, you know, going to Tucson and all over the place. And, uh, you know, I would get to these places and these people I was ministering to, these, these people were hard core sinners. They weren't, they weren't church sinners. They weren't Christians sitting around in church sitting here and there. Oh, I, 
I, I relapsed on porn this week. Oh, doggone it. I had, I went back to drinking, but I stopped after a day. You know, the, these people were filthy, nasty sinners, professional, professional. And I would preach a simple message just like this one. I'd read the scriptures to them. If they had a whiteboard, I'd put the scriptures on the board and I would show them, look, here you are and here's how you ended up here. You're a convict tossed in the trash can of society. You're in prison. That's because America and society and people, they don't want you. You're a criminal. How'd you get here? You did it. You did it. When I went to a prison to preach, man, I preached the filthiest and nastiest messages you, you've ever heard. I mean, I was so blunt with these convicts. Uh, it would have scared you. I just went in there and just pulled out shotguns and blasted them. The Holy Ghost would fall on them with conviction. When the light suddenly dawned on them, oh my God, this wasn't bad luck or karma or, you know, my parents were bad people and I wasn't raised right. Hey, this is on me. I stole, robbed, raped, murdered, pillaged. I did it. And I see it now. Deuteronomy 28, Galatians chapter 6. And I mean, I had the most glorious services I've, I've, I've ever had in my entire ministry at these prisons. The Holy Ghost would jump on these people like I'm a house on fire. These big convicts falling at the altar, crying like babies, praying like kids, begging God for mercy. Wow. Well, what happened there? Well, the convicts, uh, instead of blaming everybody all the time, that's what drug addicts, convicts, and alcoholics do. They always got somebody to blame. You, 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 you. Well, if you go to the you, you, you route, you'll end up in failure and you'll be totally lost. You'll never have anything good or virtually anything good happen to you. As long as a Christian blames somebody else for their problems, they are absolutely screwed. Well, when the Holy Ghost fell on these convicts, man, I'll tell you what, they realized, hey, this is me. This is me. I did it. I, this is what I did. I brought curses on myself. Okay? And that's why it's so important that, that you have to forgive your parents, your step-parents and your foster parents. You got to forgive your grandparents and whoever raised you. Maybe you were passed around like a soda. You got to forgive all these people. I mean, line them up and forgive them. If you don't have the miracle list, you've got to send me an email today, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send it to you, and you have to do number one on the miracle list. There's, it is absolutely unavoidable. Do you want a ministry like some of the great faith healers of all time? You can have it. You want a deliverance minister ministry like De Derek Prince or something? You can have it, but you must observe and do the word of God. And you must make sacrifices for God. There, there isn't any other way to do it. There, you know, there's no easy road. You go through the Old Testament, you see these prophets, man, they had it tough. They're in glory now with God. God only knows what kind of incredible rewards. But back then, while they were on the earth, they had it tough. And you might have it tough if you decide to start obeying the Lord. Your family's going to turn on you. Your friends are going to turn you. People at work are going to, oh, there's that guy. Good God. Yeah, that's going to happen. Yes, it is. Here and there. But I tell you what, the sacrifice is, whew, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. I left my secular counseling practice, closed down my business, laid off my employees. I quit in 2005. 
and I started doing Christian counseling. That's all I did. I never went back to the secular world because I was so happy to see God heal people and deliver them. I was so happy. And I wanted more of it, and I wanted to be a part of it. And I knew I wasn't worthy to do it. And so I looked at all my goodness and all the nice things about myself, and I went over to the toilet, popped up the lid, and just threw it all in. I threw me in the trash. Because I knew that in my flesh dwells no good thing. And if you look up no good thing in the dictionary, you'll see my picture. I'm a famous person. I I am a bag of human crap. And so I said, hey, I'm getting rid of Brother Mike, and I'm going to go with the Holy Ghost. And the results have been wonderful over the year. I've literally seen in front of my eyes thousands of people delivered from demons. I've seen hundreds of people healed right in front of my eyes. Why is that? Because I'm a great person, a good person? Oh, oh, come on, forget it. Stop it. I'm just a regular person like you. But I saw this law of sowing and reaping. The father was trying to get through to me. Hey, Mike, you know, your head. There's something wrong with your head. Listen. Listen. And pretty soon I, wait a minute, I started, I started listening. I saw it. I saw Deuteronomy 28 alive in my life. All these bad things happened because I triggered it. All these good things happened later. Hey, I obeyed. I observed and did. Okay. Sister Etter, as you know, is the most uh, anointed human being that ever lived in the United States, Mary Woodworth Etter. And uh, when she was young and married, she had, she was doing what? Uh, you know, it's back in the 1800s. She's taking care of the house and having kids. That's what women did back then. They, they were womb factories. And you just kept cranking out kids. I think she had like 11 of them. But she had a mindset back then in the 1800s. Women are second-class citizens. Men here, women here. And she couldn't get that mindset out of her head. But the Holy Ghost had chosen Sister Edder because she had a very, very spirit. And she had a very loving soul. She was a very caring, loving mother. And she was spiritual. She had a very sensitive spirit. And the Holy Ghost saw that and said, hey, I can use this woman to shake up half of the entire United States of America. I'll just pound on the devil with a big old bat. But he had to get her to overcome this insufficiency thinking pattern. I'm a woman in a man's world. Thing. No, you're not. No woman is in a man. You're in the Holy Ghost world. He makes the decisions, not society, not men, not forget about it. And that woman's ministry was so absurd and so ridiculous to this day, nobody can relate to it. John Lake who had one of the greatest ministries that anybody's ever heard of, period, referred everybody to Sister Edder and told them, pray like Sister Edder does. John Lake was amazed at her. Why? Because she had reached a point in her mind and in her life where she said, I will now observe and do his commandments and statutes, the word of God. And you're in. There's enormous hope for you in this life if you would just simply understand this simple concept of sowing and reaping. If you take offenses at people, you will reap what you sow. If you lose your temper and get angry, you will reap what you sow. 
if you're a critical person and you've run run people down or you gossip, you will reap what you sow. If you do the opposite, you will reap what you sow. If you learn like Smith Wigglesworth to step out on your faith, not just keep your faith here, that's where it doesn't do any good. Sharing it with others requires you to step out on your faith. That's what he taught. And you're there. God is no respecter of persons. You a woman, you a man. Did you flunk your GED? Hey, listen, step out on your faith and you will become like Wigglesworth, had no education at all, a third grade dropout. Boom. Sister Edder never went to school. She was a womb factory at home. She was a homemaker, taking care of the house. Right? Yeah. Catherine Coleman, she grew up, you know, lower middle class. No, edu no real education, nothing. If anybody had nothing in life, it was Catherine Coleman. Wow, look what happened to her. She said she read Deuteronomy. She said, listen, if I observe and do, all the blessings shall overtake me from God. And I will be set high above all nations on this earth. I will be up there. And that's what happened. And that's what's going to happen to you. You're going to do that. You're going to put this together. Eh? had a couple come in for counseling a uh, year and a half or so ago. Brother Mike, we're not, my, my fiance and I, we're not getting along well and things aren't going, he's doing this, he's doing that. She, she, her attitude is this, you know, I had them both sitting right there and I said, well, listen, we're not going to be able to get very far here when you guys are living together. You're not married and you're, you know, to use an old, uh, secular term, you're living in sin. And uh, I don't think they use that term anymore, but look, uh, Jesus said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, one of the Ten Commandments was adultery, and that's one of the laws in the Old Testament was carried over in the New Testament. The Old Testament was abolished, but some of the laws were carried over. Hey, if you, keep, if you guys keep committing adultery, I said, I don't really want to do any deliverance on you. Because if we cast the demons out and you guys go home and you have intercourse tonight, they're just gonna the demons are gonna just get right back in. And then I said in Matthew chapter 12, it says the last state of the man's worse than the first. So you could get worse by coming to see Brother Mike. And the purpose of my counseling ministry is to have people get better when they come and see me, not worse. Dude. You know, if you're not going to keep your pants on, uh, I don't think we need to go through deliverance today. Well, they were a little PO'd at me. And they got a little fussy before they left and so on. They accused me of judging them and all kinds of ridiculous things like that. And I just sat there calm and, you know, people say negative things about me. and Literally nothing bothers me. They left. And guess what? Yeah, they they came back a couple of months later, you know. So the law of sowing and reaping continued on, whether they were in my office or not. And if you're not going to observe and do, and that's going to be tough for me because I'm in this situation around these people. Yes, it is going to be tough, but the Holy Spirit will be with you 100% every step of the way and you will change your life and you'll change it fast he will help you that's guaranteed he will never leave you or forsake you the lord jesus will deliver you and help you overcome these sick people in your life and this sin that does so easily beset you that little sin there Deuteronomy 21, 21 uh, 28 says, Hear the word of the Lord. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and keep his commandments and follow his precepts, 
I will not put upon you any of these diseases I put on the Egyptians, for I am the eternal God who heals you. Yahweh Rothka. God is our healer. But remember, there's an if in there. There's an if in there. I had a friend of mine that came to see me uh, back in the old days at the House of Healing. And uh, I'd been struggling with him, trying to get him delivered, and it wasn't working. So one day I had him come in for another counseling appointment. I sat in the sanctuary at the House of Healing, and I went on the went on the, the whiteboard, and I just showed, illustrated how he got these demons from his dad and his mother. He had horrible parents, and their demons transferred into his body, and his their demons transferred into his mind, and his life sucked and was screwed up because it initially started with his parents. The rejection demon, the fear demons, all of them got in. I explained the whole thing to him. I went, I spent, gosh, I'd say an hour. Man, I had the whole chalkboard I was looking at, and he was sitting there going, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense, yep. Well, to shorten the story up, that was about, what was that, 14 years ago I had that meeting with him. I'm still friends with him today. He moved out of state. His life has been just one bag of misery after the other. He's currently, as I'm speaking to you now, right this second, he's in a hospital in Texas. He's sick again. And now he's getting to the age where, uh, you know, he's not he's not bouncing back. Okay, He's in his late 50s now. And this guy is in trouble. He's in trouble. Why? He just would not observe and do the word of the Lord. He would not forgive his parents. He would not forgive his sisters. They cheated him out of his inheritance. Man, it was it was ugly. And I felt very bad for the guy. I always have. He wouldn't do it. And so finally I had to start praying, Lord, uh, please help him repent. Give me another shot at at him when he's on his deathbed, just before he dies. I want to talk to him. I've done that several times in the past, and you know it's worked fantastic. But unfortunately, what's not fantastic is that some people will not change, nor will they repent until they're on their deathbed. Deathbed. Come on, stop it. But uh, if you like prophecy, okay, I'll, I'm, I'll pretend I'm a prophet right now. I'm prophesying to you that you are not going to be doing that. That is not going to be you. You're not going to change on your deathbed. You're going to change today. And you are going to be set high above all nations of the earth. You're going to hear the word of the Lord and you're going to do it. Hmm? You're not mentally ill. If you are mentally ill, hey, it's going to take a longer period of time to do that. I have worked with mentally ill people sometimes for years until they're delivered and healed. Sometimes it takes years. But if you're not mentally ill, you can do it today. You can change today. What about your husband? Is he a liar and a cheater and a piece of human pond scum? Don't raise your hand, but I mean, is that? did I just describe your husband? Huh? Did I just describe your wife? Is, is she the town pump? Is she a, dis, a disgrace? Is she a rotten mother? Did I just describe something? Okay. Okay, supernaturally, by God's grace, you are going to forgive those crazy people. You're going to do it. You say, well, can I do it? No, you can't. you got to have help. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He's your comforter. The Greek word is parakletos, and it means someone who comes by your side and stands there and supports you during your time of need. Very similar to a lawyer. Although, please disregard that word lawyer. I hate to even mention it. 
that's kind of like mentioning the C word or the F word. So it's kind of touchy. But anyway, it's similar to a, an honest lawyer. Oh, I just, that was an oxymoron. I apologize. Someone who stands by your side and supports you during your time of need. That's what a paracletus is. That's what the Holy Spirit is. Jesus called him the comforter. And I tell you what, your your wife is is cheats on you and is box of rocks sick. Maybe she's box of rocks stupid. It doesn't matter. You can forgive the woman because you have a call of God on your life, and you are not to remain in the dumps of a rotten marriage anymore. Do you understand that? You ought to forgive these insane people. Well, Brother Mike, there's so many of them. I tried to do number one on the miracle list, and every other day, another name would pop into my head. That proves that God is helping you. Do you understand that? It's a Holy Ghost. He's clicking your memory. Hey, what about Brenda? What about Dick? Oh, Brother Mike, I got to go back to the number one on the miracle. Well, go back to it enthusiastically and put that new name on there. That's God helping you. Do you see that? The Bible calls that discernment. You have it. You have it. You're on your way to being a spiritual killer. But it'll never happen unless you observe and do the word of the Lord. If you will not forgive your brother their trespasses, neither will your heavenly father forgive yours. Come on. Do it. I can't do it. Lord, help me do it. I just prayed the prayer of faith for you right there. Did you hear that? Lord, help me do it. Wow, this is deep. Brother Mike's like Dr. Sproul. He's a Bible scholar. No, I'm just presenting the word of God the way it should be presented. In the simplicity of Christ. You can do it today and you will do it. You will change. Yeah. Now, hey. I get it. If you just went through an inheritance thing, you went through the gates of hell. Okay. Um, your dad died and here's, here's his assets. And guess who came out of the woodwork? Brothers and sisters you haven't heard from in years. Guess what happens during the inheritance? It's a Trojan war. I mean, there's dead bodies everywhere. An inheritance fight is some of the worst, most vindictive things you'd ever be involved in. Okay. Your relatives are stealing money from you. They're stealing your assets. That guy I just told you about is in the hospital. He went through an inheritance battle when his dad died and his sister screwed him out of all kinds of money and assets. And to this day, the guy's broke. His sisters hung him out to dry. I couldn't get him to forgive his sisters. Okay? So if you're going through an inheritance, it's a setup of demons. It's a setup. They're doing it to anger you. They're doing getting getting you to feel like you're a victim. Uh, they want you to get into a pity party. They want you to fight for your rights. See? That's what Kelsey does with the chief. You have to fight for your right to party. Well, he's going to die and go to hell, but you're fighting for your rights, for your inheritance, and everything's going bad for you. Look, if you will allow the Lord to fight for you, Deuteronomy 28, and you will hear the word of the Lord, and you for, will forgive these rotten siblings of yours, and there's nothing worse than an inheritance fight. I mean to tell you, it's it's bad. It's really bad. I'll take that back. Sometimes cheating spouses can be worse. If your spouse cheats with your sister or your brother, that's kind of in the same league. But my point simply is these inheritance battles are a certified card carrying nightmare. And it's all a trick to get you to take an offense. That's exactly what the demons are doing with your inheritance, trying to get you to be offended. I'm getting screwed. I can't believe this. This isn't fair. This isn't right. Oh, my God. The lawyers, 
They're all lying. They're criminals. They suck. Yeah, that's a lawyer. Okay, stop it. You have got to forgive these rotten relatives. Let God fight for you. Let him step up for you. If you keep fighting and digging in like an Alabama tick, this thing's going to go very bad for you, and you're going to end up in a hospital decades later, like my friend is right now, with no inheritance. He's broke. Every all those all that money and assets his dad accumulated over the years, he got virtually none of it. I think he got a pickup. The sisters threw him stuff they didn't want, so he got a pickup and a few other things. But trust me, it's all gone. You know, and he got bitter over it, and there was anger, and the siblings were fighting. Oh, man. I mean, it is awful. Awful. Do an end around on the devil today. Just obey the word of God, and you will be placed high above all nations, high above that inheritance, high above that cheating spouse. Forgive your sister for sleeping with your husband. Will you do that? Call her right now. What's her name? Deborah? Okay. What What is her name? Wakinta? Call Wakinta and tell her, you know, I got to thinking about us praying the other day. You know what? I just want to apologize to you for, you know, I took some offenses years ago over a few things. And I'm, I didn't call here to rehash anything. I just want to tell you that God showed me that I need to change. And I want you to know I forgive you and I re, I'm praying for you. And I hope you'll forgive me. And I just wanted you to know that. I love you and I'm praying for you. Thank you. Bye. Click. You know what you just did? You just shoved an ice pick through the devil's left eye. An ice pick. I mean, you busted him up. When he heard you do that, he freaked. Do that with your inheritance. Do that with your parents. Huh? Remember Uncle Fester on the Adams family? The bald guy? Remember him? Well, he was a child star. And he made, uh, again, this back in the 40s. He was a multi-millionaire before he got out of grade school. But back in the day, the law required the parents to be the guardian over a child's money until they reached uh, adulthood. Well, his parents, his parents were drunks and they squandered all of his money. They squandered all of it. So when he, when he got old enough that he could legally be in charge of his estate and his money as an adult, he found out his parents had blown the blown everything. He had nothing. You ever have a guy named McClocky Cochran? The guy that was on Home Alone? Remember that guy? Yep. Happened again. Remember that short guy that was on uh, uh, what you talking about, Willis? What was his name? I mean, that guy was worth millions when he was a kid. Guess what happened? It happened again. Where's my money, Mom? Where's my money, Dad? Oh, darn. What money, son? Gone. The money. He said, what you talking about, Dad? Where's my money? You know what that poor guy did? He lived in life of total misery and bitterness. Um, he got married and his wife pushed him down the stairs at his house and killed the guy. He was having to work as a security guard to survive. He was working as a security guard, you know, an unarmed security guard. He didn't have any money. This guy was on a hit TV show for years, was worth millions, gone. Wow. You believe that? His wife didn't even bother to go to the hospital. 
She couldn't care less about him. She was looking for a meal ticket. Look, you know what you're looking for? The anointing and power of the Holy Ghost. And you're going to forgive them. Is that easy to do? No, but the Spirit of the Lord will help you do it because it just simply has to be done. Yeah. While traveling here in America, I'll go ahead and close with this. I'm getting too windy today. I apologize for that. Wigglesworth was traveling around the United States, and uh, he went to several different states. He came here to Arizona, and we was praying for people that had tuberculosis. That was big back then. There were all kinds of people healed of tuberculosis, and Wigglesworth came to Phoenix. Unbelievable. But Wigglesworth had gone to one uh, church in Minnesota and um, had a spectacular meeting. He was there for a week. Untold numbers of people got healed. The church attendance tripled. I mean, Wigglesworth did everything he could possibly do to help them. And the pastor stabbed him in the back. Stabbed him in the back. Stole his offering. Wigglesworth dropped it and went to the next town. Didn't even <laughs> didn't even give it another flinch. You know why? Because he wanted a thousand miracles in the next town, and he knew if he took an offense over this backstabbing pastor, that the miracles in the next town weren't going to materialize. How about you doing that? How about you doing that? Would you do that? I know you will. You know, I believe in you. I think you're going to make the right decision. And I think you're going to end up high above all nations of the earth. I think you're going to fulfill your destiny. You've been called by God. See you next time.